So I'm 30 years old. I want a biological age of 20. And I can go to these companies that are out there and get tested and they'll tell me some sort of biological age. They'll tell me I am. My body is acting in such a way that I'm akin to a 40 year old or my body is acting in such a way that I'm akin to a four year old, hopefully not that young, but you know, so that's kind of the, the, the premise in the landscape of testing for biological age right now. You approach it a bit differently though. I've heard you say that biological age is kind of not something that you want to represent in such a manner that you have a biological age of a 40 year old, 50 year old, 20 year old, whatever. Why is that? We've concluded lately that it's you know a less useful metric than many believe. Um, at best, it is a very well-intentioned but flawed approach to helping people understand the concept of aging. And at worst, uh, it borders on scientific malfeasance. Um, the real value lies in assessing the rate of aging, which is a more accurate index than determining biological age. Scientifically, biological age really oversimplifies the complex interplay of genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors that influence aging. And philosophically, um, it perpetuates really a misleading narrative that we can become younger uh, as we age. And so in reality, um, we can only slow the rate of aging or biological entropy. And this understanding is crucial um, for developing meaningful interventions and lifestyle modification. So while it's tempting uh, to think uh, we can reverse aging, it's more accurate uh, to focus on slowing its, its uh, progression. Well, I've heard people say that, like, um, you can't become younger, right? It's impossible. Uh, what you can do, though, is be the healthiest 40-year-old, 30-year-old, 20-year-old possible, right? And so it's not so much about, like, because you're, you're never going to go back to being 20 years old. The, the biology is just different, right? And Right. Yeah, right. I mean, and when they say you're 20 years old, I want to always ask, well, who, what 20 year old, unless you sampled this person when they were 20 and now you're following up at 45 and you're saying, well, your metabolism still looks like you, like it was when you were 20, um, which we don't have any capacity to do that yet. We don't, we don't have any database that shows, you know, those things yet. Um, or a testing system or an entity that can do that. Hopefully Ethereum will, will solve this need in the future. Um, but we, we, we say you're a 25 year old, what 25 year old? Is it you when you were 25? We don't have data on that. We weren't monitoring data on that. Um, it's really, um, it's really the rate of aging and slowing that down and making sure that the, the processes that we know are impacted by aging, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, lipid metabolism, and all of these pathways that are implicated in aging, um, that we can slow their progression. Um, and, and the only way to halt it, like actually say I'm done aging is to you know, realistically turn yourself into a crystal and turn the temperature down to absolute zero. Then you have salted entropy, which is really the underlying mechanism. You know, all of this is physics, right? When we talk about chemistry, we talk about biology, it's all physics. It, it cannot escape the laws of physics and entropy is inherent in a biological system, you will die, you will age. Um, that is inescapable unless, like I mentioned, you turn yourself into a crystal and turn your temperature down to absolute zero. Um, it's the only thing we know of, right? Uh, I think a lot of things have been proven to be helpful for aging. Um, a lot of them make meaningful sense. A lot of the literature has been, has been shown to, to do that. We have the tools to drastically slow down aging and not just increase your lifespan, but increase your health span. It's not enough to say that we want you to live another 15 years, but we want you to be able to pick up your grandchildren. We want you to be able to take trips. We want you to be able to cook for yourself and clean yourself. And, and those are issues of the health span, not the lifespan. Having an additional 15 years of misery is not something I think anybody would sign up for. They want to make sure that those moments are spelt, spent in a healthful state, um, one that respects um, you know, human dignity. Well, I think it's a, a sticky concept and that's probably why it's become so widespread is because everybody can relate to it, right? You can say, well, my body is acting in such a way as a 20 year old, but it's a basis in which we can communicate with that we all understand. Whereas if you were to say my rate of aging is a five, well, what does that mean? I have no idea. So can you unpack a little bit? Like, why can't you tell me, Micah, my biological age? 
Well, in, the, in the sense yeah. of you can tell me the rate, but why can't you tell me I'm a 25 year old or a 40 year old? Well, because again, that goes back to what 25 year old, a healthy 25 year old, a non healthy 25 year old. Even if let's we say, take let's say healthy 2500 healthy 25 year olds out there, because we don't know that they're, they're healthy, right? They're making yeah. some sort of comparison to um, groups of people. They're making comparisons to groups of people that are often much smaller than 500. Um, and when we have a sample size like that, it is not indicative of all 25 year olds to have a, a sample size that can be inferred with reasonable power um, to all 25 year olds. I mean, I don't I haven't done the power calculation, but you, you would need thousands. Um, and oftentimes it's like a small group of, you know, 30 people. So um, why can't we get thousands and run that test? Because it costs money. It costs money to get people enrolled in trials, to get people um, compensated for their participation, um, to then get those samples and analyze them, to pay people to run those machines, to buy the reagents, to analyze the data. All of this is incredibly ex expensive. And as I mentioned, the largest like multi omic data set that I've ever seen is like 7,700 people roughly. And um, and that's still not enough. And it's it's an incredibly uh, time intensive, labor intensive process, which is why we uh, at Ethereum as a commercial entity feel like we're best positioned to do this because we're not related, we're not dependent on um, the changing uh, funding narratives, uh, directives of the NIH. We're not dependent on um, you know changing structure in our colleges or, or the administrations that oversee us because we are all of those things to ourselves. And so um, I think with longevity, we will get there. I think we will win this race in, in curating this vast data set that will tell us what a average 25 year old is. Now the microbiome science, they've been trying to do that for so long. For the last 15 years, this very intensive effort has been led to find the ideal microbiome. And that's not the case yeah, because there is no ideal say, I that, microbiome. You know, I, think, I think it's not just a factor of, of data and how many people you have, but also bioindividuality, right? It's mm -hmm. like, because, because then when you're saying, well, we don't have enough data, then I go, well, go get some more data then. Like, and then tell me my biological age. But there's yeah. more to it than that. Absolutely. So, you know, and, and this is really highlighted in the microbiome space, and we can obviously extrapolate to ourselves, but there is no one perfect microbiome, and it's completely contingent on the foods you eat, the environment you live in, the people you live with, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're the people who cohabitate with you, you will eventually start to share similar microbes. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's so many things that go into that. And it's this oversimplification to say like, where, what is the, uh, the ideal microbiome? We're not going to get there. Um, the idea is to contextualize that within the relevant healthscape of that individual and, the same is applied to the metabolome, such that for certain people, an ideal metabolome might consist in having very high levels of niacinamide, given, let's say, certain mutations that um, preclude its proper metabolism. In other individuals, a normative amount of niacinamide is just fine. Um, what does it What does it mean to that individual is, is contingent on various genetic environmental factors that all have this interplay. And the expression is, you know, again, as unique as you are. This, this whole idea of biological age, it is a very well-intentioned attempt to get people to understand aging. It is hard to say you're a five, normative scores are four to seven. Um, so if you're below a four, you're aging too fast. And if you're above a seven, then you're aging optimally slow. Um, that is one way to get people to um, understand it. It requires a little bit of mathematical explanation. But to say you're a 25-year-old, people go woohoo. Right. And so that it's a very well intentioned attempt to get people to understand an incredibly complex and interconnected process. It is a construct aging, right? It's not a biomarker, it's a construct. We need biomarkers to speak to that construct. And so um, it is very well intentioned. Explain but again, because that. that's that's a that's that's a probably the best way to sum it up. Oh right? man. Is that <laughs> aging is not a biomarker, it's no. a construct, right? So unpack yeah. that more because that's that's a really good statement. Yeah, so when we talk about, you know, um, constructs, uh, okay, so something like, um, and it, something can be both, okay? Something can be both. It just depends on what part of the equation it sits. Um, let's take an example of height. Height is both a con construct that can be used, um, as, uh, biomarkers can be used to assess it, 
but it is also um, a uh, biomarker itself, right? So if we're looking at, you know, um, you know, mobility issues or, or you know, pro a propensity for osteoporosis, height might be a biomarker for that. But when we talk about it as a construct, it is a construct itself. And then maybe, you know, arm span is the biomarker for that. Blood pressure is a biomarker. It's speaking to the construct of cardiovascular disease, right? It is speaking to the construct of heart disease, right? And so we measure blood pressure. It is a biomarker. But how do we measure cardiovascular disease? It's a multifaceted construct that is contingent on various underlying variables. When we talk about something like aging, it is the construct of aging. It is, it is not a thing that exists on its own. It is itself dependent on your genome, on the expression of that genome, on the folding of your proteins, interactions with your microbiome, and Ultimately, we are able to um, detect that in, in the uh, metabolome, in the blood metabolome, and give you a rate of aging as a result of that. And so we are looking at biomarkers, which are directly measured. When you talk about a marker, it must be something that you can directly measure. I was recently looking at um, a health test. Again, I don't want to you know, disparage anyone. I think testing is fantastic. I think regular testing is, um, as the studies have shown, is one of the fan most fantastic and efficacious ways to reduce your risk of so many diseases just through regular recurrent testing monitoring. So I don't want to disparage any testing companies, but I was talking to a salesperson, admittedly not one of their scientists, and it's a sort of a breath device. It measures O2 and CO2. It's essentially a modified metabolic cart. And I was saying, what biomarkers do you look at? And he was like, all right, so we have 14 biomarkers. And he was like, cardiovascular health, uh, neural aging, um, aging, toxicity. And I was like, no, 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 those are your constructs. What are you using to infer to those constructs? What are you using underneath the hood to calculate to them? And I mean, I gotta be honest, I knew the answer was O2 and CO2. And so when when he was you know, basically telling me that, oh, it's just basically your 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 oxygen consumption and your CO2 production. I was like, okay, you have two biomarkers. And from those two, you are inferring 14 domains. That is impossible. And it is essentially a lie. It is a big fat lie. And yeah, um, because it's possible for somebody to have a good VO2 max with stage four liver cancer, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We see it in, in, you know, marathon so you, athletes you all the time. You can't say that because of your VO2 max, you have a healthy liver. Or they're complete. Yeah, them. they're completely unrelated in many. They're completely decoupled in many instances. And so, and to say that, and it goes just goes back to that like placebo effect. Like, well, at eight percent, it's seen. Well, at eight percent, anything can be related to eight percent. And so, um, I, I kind of had a moment of, I guess, a little bit of first astonishment. I went through like the Kubler Ross model of acceptance, where it was like <laughs> denial, anger, astonishment, and finally, like I went through all of that within a three minute period with this guy. If you listening are interested in what Dr. Jasby is talking about, he actually has a free book that you can get with a sample report. So he provides a test that uses a dry blood spot. So essentially you can take the test at home, get an understanding of what's going on in your body um, and what you can do about it. Um, but you can get that sample report that outlines exactly what this test or report might look like for you. Um, in addition to that, once you get the free book, you get the free sample report, you can do a free one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Jasby. So uh, there'll be a scheduling link in there once you enter in your email for the free stuff. Um, totally free. Talk with Dr. Jasby, especially if you're a clinic. I highly recommend this. Uh, answer any of your questions. He knows the nuts and bolts and the science <laughs> of all this stuff. So he'll be able to lead you through that and give you a really good understanding of the work that he's doing. He is ushering in health care 3.0. And I have no hesitancy in saying that. I think it's just absolutely astonishing what you've developed. So if you want to get all that stuff that I just talked about, Go to the link uh, you can see it on the screen here if you're watching. It's www.therio.me slash guide, um, and that will give you access to all those free resources. So thanks, Dr. Jasby. Thank you for having me, Michael.